Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Bourguignon, for having me here. It's a real honor to address uh, a crowd of very distinguished mathematicians. A bit challenging for me. I think in terms of mathematical language, there is at least one person here that speaks Italian, <laughs> and hence, sorry about my name, because <laughs> my name in Italian means crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> I, have, I can't help with that. So um, what the little story I'm going to tell you today is about the synergy of uh, this quantum chemist, who is a very well-known in the field of quantum chemistry, Professor Richard Bader, late Professor Richard Bader. And this, of course, our giant today, uh, René Tom. Richard Bader has used some of the concept of René Tom's particular uh, catastrophe theory in trying to reshape the language of description in the, in the field of chemistry. So the style would be a little different because of this. Ceci n'est pas un mathématicien. Ceci, c'est un simple chimiste. Pardon. OK. So uh, having uh, this disclaimer out of the way, we start with a little bit of history. It's not a history lecture, but uh, it's a, you know, a little bit of history is relevant. And the atomic theory, of course, is the modern atomic theory is due to John Dalton and uh, by who discovered the law of multiple proportion where the atom, you know, different elements combine in, in simple proportions. And sh shortly thereafter, Gay Lussac came along and noticed that when you combine gases, they combine also in simple proportions. And Avogadro put the final nail in this and said, well, I hypothesize that uh, at a given temperature and pressure, a given volume of a gas will contain the same number of molecules. The, mo the word is more recent, but by back then it had a different name. So I jumped, I jumped like three or four decades of an intense work, but people like Kekuli and others started to represent chemical structures by graphs. In Kekuli's original paper, it was described like this, but it didn't look like a hexagon. Later on, it was converted into the common uh, hexagon that you probably all know, which is here representing all the atoms, the carbons, the hydrogens, and the dashes here represents the valence because, you know, it was known, for example, that methane has four hydrogens and one carbon in the middle. And hence, it was known that the valence, the capacity to combine with other elements, is four. And hence, you have to have four arms on carbon, one, two, three, four, and hydrogen, one arm, and so on. So the chemist invented this notation. Later on, uh, you know, it was Dewar and other people have remarked that there is no reason to favor a pair of atoms in order to put this stick, this double stick. So it has to be what we call a resonance hybrid, a word due to Linus Pauling, double, doubly Nobel Prize winner of peace and of chemistry. So it's very often represented by this circle in the middle to indicate that there is a delocalization of these electrons over the system. There's no reason to favor one structure to the other. It's a resonant hybrid. All this is very well known. This is like one chemistry 101. Uh, I jumped again a few decades to the early 20th century with the work of Gilbert Newton Lewis, one of the most important chemists, nom nominated for a Nobel Prize for 40 times, but for some reason he didn't get it. But every first year chemistry book, I would say, I have taught first year chemistry, I would say probably 50 to 60, 70% of the content come from one paper 
from this gentleman. In, the paper was published in JAX, the Journal of the American Chemical Society, in 1916. Very important paper where he, for the first time, proposes that there is something special between pairs of electrons. And you've got to give him a lot of credit because that was before the concept of spin was discovered in the 20s by many workers experimentally and theoretically until Pauling, uh, Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli, uh, developed the theory of the spin, which is a relativistic phenomenon. But at the time of, Linus, of uh, Lewis, no one knew about spin. No one had any reason to uh, think that a pair of electrons has any kind of stability, they are supposed to repel each other columbically. So he even go into his paper, the paper is long, but it's really a revelation to read this paper. Uh, the paper, he even go to the extent of saying that Coulomb's law may fail at short distances of the atomic dimensions. So Lewis is very important, but what the moral of the story I'm going to tell you you see these sticks, they represent pairs of electrons now. Now, how do chemists assign a structure? It's based on distances. And where do we get the distances from? Either NMR work, nuclear magnetic resonance, just like the MRI that people have, but in terms of in the lab, or X-ray diffraction experiments. This is what gives you the distances. Based on the distant criterion, which whenever two atoms are closer than the so-called van der Waal radii, they would put a stick and they will qualify the sticks two or three sticks depending on the known chemistry, the valence. So, that's, so this is just the geometry <coughs> and of the morphine of the brain, this leucine encephalin is what we find, knock my foot here or my knee here, after a few seconds I feel no pain because the morphine in this molecule kicks up in my brain. It, it, it's fine now. <laughs> but uh, so this is how they put these sticks between the, 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 the atoms. Now the chemical space is enormous. It's more than the number of stars in the universe or the, no, the estimated number of stars in the universe is enormous. It's 10 to the power, power 60. Uh, each of these possible compounds have a different structure that is stable. It's a stable structure, and I'm using this very carefully, the word here, because that's where René Tom comes in. So the stable structure is represented by an atomic graph or a molecular graph. And we have, thought, as I said, millions and millions of compounds that are known, that are measured. So how can we systematize this instead of arbitrary drawing sticks? Is there a fundamental way that systematizes this from fundamental physics? That's the question that was answered by the second person that I presented at the beginning, Richard Bader. So, this is, the, this is a very well-known book in theoretical chemistry. It's uh, published by Oxford University Press in 1990. It is by uh, a single author, Richard Bader. And in this book, he shows there is a chapter number three, I think it's three, is entirely about René Tom, catastrophe theory. Uh, so today I'm just going to give you the very, very <laughs> shell, you know, the top of the iceberg, so to speak. But of course, it's much deeper than what I present today. So he based this on analyzing the electron density. And why is the electron density? What is the electron density? The electron density is a probability in space weighted by the number of electrons in the system. So water has 10 electrons. What is the probability of finding an electron here multiplied by 10? So if you integrate it, you get 10. You can calculate it from theory. If you know the anti-symmetric many electron wave function, or state function is a better word, where it depends on the, the big X here, the heavy axes 
are the three space coordinate press spin, alpha or beta, or you can get that here. And this mode of integration means I integrate over all the coordinates of all the electron, but one, leave one out, followed by summation over spins, so that you average over spins. So you, you don't know the nature, is it spin up or down? I don't care, there is an electron. Of course, you, you, can, you can have a spin density as well, but not, that's not our purpose here, the total density. Or you can get it from the Fourier transform of the complete, of a truncated set of structure factors. And these come from X-ray diffraction experiments. So it's accessible from experiment and from theory, and that's a major advantage because then you can do X-ray experiments to verify the theory. So furthermore, in 1964, Hohenberg and Cohn derived the very, Hohenberg is, Pierre Hohenberg is French, derived the very important two theorems, one of which is the first Hohenberg-Cohn theorem that tells you that the electron density determines essentially all the properties of the system, functionally. There is a functional relation as a functional, and this is the basis of modern density functional theory, for which, uh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Cohn received the Nobel Prize. <coughs> the problem is that the functional form is not usually known. So this is an existence theorem, but nevertheless, the density has a fundamental importance. That's the point. So here is an example of a density of morphine, the molecule morphine, the opioid, the painkiller, you know, uh, par excellence. So here is the structure. Oops, sorry. I shouldn't do that. Oops. Back. Go back. Back. So <laughs> there is a delay. There is a, a lag period here. Back. Oh, I should point here. Back. That will work. Yeah, that works. <laughs> See? Not entirely. There it is. So you see, this is a section. It's, it's, a, it's a section in the plane of the molecule where it is planar, here. And you can see here, visually, the structure right there. This is a density you can calculate from quantum mechanics, or you can get from X-ray diffraction experiment, period. It's, a, it's a, an observable field, scalar field. It has big mountains that are truncated here because they, are, they will dwarf the hydrogens. These are, this is like a hydrogen. This is an oxygen hydrogen here, peak. These are extremely high compared to the hydrogen, so we had to cut it off here, all right? But these, are, these peaks are actually cusps. They are not true maxima because in the Hamiltonian, we don't usually take the, the finite size of the nucleus into consideration because it's 10 to the power minus five compared to the order of magnitude of the size of the atom. So it, it, it's, it's an enormously cumbersome problem to take the, the sometimes when you do Ms. Bauer spectroscopy, you need the finite nuclear size, but not in general, no. 99% of the time you just ignore, it's a point. So you have a discontinuity, you have a singularity position of the nuclei. So, and you can see here, this is a cusp and this is a truncated max, you know, cusp. Or, so, So here is another view of the same field, essentially. And what I want to emphasize is the shape of the field. Like if we have, I apologize for giving my back. Um, if you see here, you know, this continues, of course. So you have a ridge here. It's a saddle, but there is a saddle point right there. So here, so here, there, is, there are saddle points around the whole structure. And then there is a minimum here in the ring and a minimum there in the other ring. So this, there is a minimum here, there's a minimum here. This is the oxygen, that's the OH here, and that's a carbon nucleus. And of course the nucleus dominates the, the, the topography because the nuclei are, are the only source of attraction in the molecule. This is what holds the molecule together, is nuclear electron attraction. So no wonder you have a maximum, uh, a cusp, not a true maximum, but I will call it maximum. 
at the nuclear. So let's label it and just I will, sh uh, you know, here I will just pinpoint the position of these critical points where these are called bond critical points because they correspond to the chemist's bond, what they draw in on, on the piece of paper. And the one in the middle, the yellow thing, you know, I just will show you a couple here. Uh, here's, here's, the bond, here's the bond path. It's a line of maximum density linking bonded nuclei. Whenever the chemists draw this stick, uh, this stick in particular here, this one is this one, you have a, a ridge in the density that links these nuclei in physical space. And that's quite remarkable in my opinion, because since Kekulé and these guys in the 1800s, no one has ever been able to put a mapping between something that the chemists draw on the basis of, of knowledge of chemistry and the composition of the compound and the valence and something physical, a physical field. So that's remarkable. Some people say it's trivial. So watch until my last slide and you will see my comment and reply on this trivial thing. I don't think it's trivial at all, in fact, my opinion. Um, so, so from the previous slide, you can extract these lines that are no longer just sticks that are drawn. These are calculated or observed. You can get it either way. They sometimes are curved. You can see that this is not a line. This is really a, it curves here, if you notice. Uh, this one curves quite significantly. And notice that there are more lines than the traditional chemical structure, which misses some stuff. You know, you could find in a book dot, dot, dot. Here is called the hydrogen bond. But you can see it right away here. You don't need any, you know, uh, uh, arbitrary decision where to put these dots. It, it, it emerges from the topography of the density and hence they're translating into its topology. So this is an interesting molecule, it's called cubane for good reason, because it's a cube of carbon uh, saturated with hydrogen to complete the valence. You have different types of critical points because now I have bond, look at these curves. The curves actually, the more curved the bond pass, the more it is unstable. It won't pew, it's like snap. So, and it actually correlates. There are, there are correlation between the energy of the dissociation of this, uh, these bonds and that curvature. But this is beside, beside my point here. If that was an e isolated molecule, there is a, the Poincaré Hopf relationship that relates the number of nuclear critical points. And they are not truly critical points for the reason I indicated, but they behave as if they were nuclear maxima number of bond critical points, nuclear critical points, bond critical points, number of rings, the yellow ones, and number of cage critical points where the minimum structure that would have a cage in molecular system is two surfaces. You need at least two surfaces. Sometimes you, you don't need three surfaces. Two are enough. But um, it's very rare to find two surfaces with a cage inside. You need at least three in general. But there are two or three examples in the literature that found what I alluded to. So a, a critical point is a critical point. You know, the gradient of, of the scalar field here is the density. The electron density vanishes and vanishes vectorially. So every single component is zero, not their sum. And you can always define the Hessian. And since it is diagonalizable, you can always diagonalize it and find the main curvatures. So we have three curvatures at these critical points. And on the basis of the sign of these curvatures, these three curvatures, these three lambdas, and on the sum of this sign, we can classify the types of critical point in a simple way. So we have the rank, the number of non-zero curvature for a stable chemical structure. That has to be three. And we have the signature, which is the, just the sum of the signs. So if it is positive, I put plus one. If it is negative, I put minus one. So based on that, here is the summary of the type of, of uh, critical points that we have seen in the cubane example that I indicated earlier, where you have a local maximum 
which is the nuclear critical point where the nuclei exist, the saddle point <coughs> between the nuclei, which is the bond critical point that indicate chemical bonding where you put a stick between the nuclei, a minimum in a given plane, like the one that is on the, mi the middle of this hexagon that I showed in, in morphine, or in the faces of the cube, the middle of the face of the cube, the centroid, or the center of, in the case of the cube. The um, local minimum here, where anywhere you look, it goes up the electron density, and that would be the cage critical point. In the middle of the cube, center, the center of the cube, is, a is an example of a cage critical point. So, I will, this is really elementary. It's, it's boron trifluoride molecule. But, but it's, in, it's important, it's elementary but important in my opinion. So boron trifluoride is a simple tetraatomic molecule. It has a boron in the middle and then th three fluorine atoms attached to it. It has this topography in the plane. Again, uh, we cut here this because it's too high. And this is a planar uh, map of the electron density where you climb the density like this. And this is the associated gradient vector field. Simple. Of course, if I climb any, uh, any, all the nuclei act as attractors for the gradient vector field. No, no surprise. And I, how do I split this into atoms? The picture is highly suggestive visually, but we will see that this is actually fundamentally justified in a second. Visually, if I start, if I climb this mountain from here or here or here, I will always, I will always reach the attractor. So if I, if I start to climb like this ad hoc, you know, anywhere, and I chose this point specifically because it shows how they diverge here, one to the nucleus on the right, one to the nucleus on the left. Yet, if you choose one particular set of gradient vector field lines that start exactly here, you will just go nowhere. You will go in the middle. You will go actually to the bond critical point, the saddle point between the nuclei. And when you're here, of course, this is a saddle point. If you want to climb, there is only one way to the left, one way to the right and that you are drawing what the chemists are drawing for centuries. Stick, stick, stick. No one has ever seen this before. Richard Bader. So uh, here is the structure that you would draw as a chemist. And to just, um, there are two more points I want to make about this slide before I leave it. First of all, notice that if you live on any of these surfaces made by a set of gradient vector field lines, of course there will be no, nothing crossing it. It's a zero flux surface in the gradient vector field of the electron density. However, if you take an arbitrary line, like this one, is always there is always a component of the gradient vector of the density crossing it. So now I can select one of these surfaces for a reason that will become apparent that has no crossing of the gradient vector field uh, through it. There is no flux locally in the gradient vector field. And this will be the, the, the magenta lines here that will partition that system into isolated subsystems, like in thermodynamics when you have the total system and you have a subsystem of thermodynamics, an open system by definition, it's a system within a system, and it has boundary and there are fluxes between the boundaries of energy and matter, sorry? Pardon me? Sorry, I heard someone. Yes? So those, those lines, so we are in, in three space. Yeah. So how, how can lines separate themselves? Yeah. I will show you actually the three space here, uh, if this movie works. So this is the molecular graph. This is actually in three space. So what you see outside is the Van der Waal surface of this molecule. And I will start removing atoms so that you see the shape. I remove the, blo the, bro the boron now. You see it has this shape. It's not a sphere anymore because it's influenced by its neighbors. I will start removing one of the three fluorines. Next. So you can see the surface 
between the fluorine and the, the, the boron here. And when I remove the third one, uh, you will see this is just the fluorine in boron trifluoride. It has a surface and, and, and you can define, you can integrate things within that volume to get a property of the atom in the molecule. Does it answer your question, more or less? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, why is this zero flux surface important? It's because it has fundamental justification. If you start from this identity, uh, rearranged in this manner, they just use uh, psi as any function, any complex function. But psi here is a one electron wave function, state function. Now, if you multiply just by a bunch of fundamental constant, for a reason that will become apparent in a few moments, uh, multiply by reduced Planck's constant, this is h over 2 pi, the mass of the electron, uh, and you sum over the number of particles in the system, water, that would be 10 electrons, here 10 electrons. Then, because the indistinguishability of electrons, I can replace the operation of an operator 10 times over the coordinates of 10 different electrons by 10 times the operator. So you just, instead of having the summation, I can just multiply by 10 electrons, and that's it. So where does this lead? This will lead us to the following. I inserted, I, this is the previous equation, after you insert this mode of integration, which re I remember, uh, I recall the mode of integration, I, I integrate over all the coordinates of all the electron but one, and then followed by the summation over spins to get a density. But here the units are such that when we inserted these constants, it has converted these into energy density. So if you integrate these numbers, you get energies, electron volts, for example, or Hartree's. Now, this is a form of the kinetic energy density known as the Schrodinger form. This is the gradient form of the kinetic energy density. Of course, if you integrate this over the whole system, you can have to get the same number. Otherwise, you're not doing physics, you're doing fiction. However, there is this term here that is bugging the equality, but that term at infinity vanishes. So all is working fine. These two forms of the kinetic energy density will integrate, if you integrate on the remaining space coordinate, you will get the same number as required. So this is the first case that I just indicated. Uh, if you integrate the remaining coordinate, this, this final dr here, because the tau, the, these are, these size depend on x, y, z, so r, and spin. So we integrated over everything except one. So the remaining, and we summed over all spins, so you have one r remaining. So if you integrate over the remaining r, over all space, of course, you get an equality, otherwise there's something wrong. The problem is, how about if instead of doing this integral over all space, you do it so over a part of the space? So here, because of the equation that I introduced, this beta uh, zero flux condition, when you use the diversion theorem to convert this into a surface integral, because that term dies when you pick the surface, as I indicated in the visually, in the, 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 the slide where I did this animation, that term is gone, and only then you will have legitimate averages of the electronic kinetic energy within bounded surfaces within an, a molecule. So the total kinetic energies of the electron within an atom in a molecule. That's a, that's a pretty tough thing to do and very useful because once we've done that, once we've done that, then again, 
the kinetic energy is well defined now, otherwise it's not well defined. If I take an arbitrary, if I have a water molecule and I decide I take this volume, it may work, it may not work, it's, there's no guarantee. But when you partition the water molecule on these surfaces, the kinetic energy is well defined. You get one number no matter what uh, type of density you integrate, which, which, which you should have if you're doing physics. Once you've done that, and if you had a virial theorem in operation, you can then, using the virial theorem and the definition of the total energy as the sum of the kinetic and the potential, you can get the contribution of that atom to the energy of the molecule, to the energy of the system. And this is a big deal. Like, this is a real big deal because um, in order to partition the energy of the molecule, how are you going to partition the nuclear-nuclear reaction, nuclear-nuclear uh, uh, repulsion? For example, per atom, don't know. No one has, or the electron, electron, the electrons of that atom was the electron of that. How are you going to partition this? It's impossible. So there are terms that are really impossible to partition, but you go around it by this uh, virial theorem that was derived by Bader in the 70s and summarized in his book here. So where does this lead into? Ah, before I leave, of course, you can integrate any property over the volume that you just defined in order to get the corresponding contribution of that atom to the molecular property, whether it is dipole moment, whether it is the polarizability, whether it is all sorts of property, energy. So back to the molecular graph. Uh, here is a chemical structure of water deduced on the basis of known chemistry. This is the molecular geometry that you can get from molecular from um, diffraction experiment on ice, for example, or something. You put a stick arbitrarily. Now notice what happens here. So. Here I got this beautiful plot from the thesis of uh, Sanchez, uh, supervised by Professor Hernández uh, Trujillo in UNAM, Mexico. And you can see here the structure superposed on uh, the electron density field, scalar field, with some representative lines of the gradient vector field associated with this density. And you can see the zero flux surfaces that partition the system here. So that's a hydrogen atom basin. This is a hydrogen atom basin. And this is the oxygen, nothing looking like a sphere. No more sphere there. It has a particular shape. An atom in a molecule is no longer just a sphere. So here it is. And you can see the bond critical point here between these two, the oxygen and the hydrogen. Another bond critical point, nothing between the hydrogens because it's not a hydrogen molecule. Now, how about if I start, so the molecule has 109 degrees like this. What if I start pushing it? At some point, these hydrogen, which are my elbow, are going to start to form a bond. Once they form a bond, you will have a critical point for the ring that will form. And then if you keep doing that, it, you will have an oxygen atom departing and a hydrogen molecule departing from the bottom. So this is where we're headed. So before I go there, yeah, I, here is another example. This is uh, vinegar, acetic acid. <laughs> Le vinaigre, oui. C'est aigre. <laughs> so, ah, j'aime le vinaigre, j'aime le balsamique. <laughs> But, alors, euh, so, voilà la densité électronique ici. Vous voyez les, 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 les points de rebroussement, rebroussement ici, uh, the, the, the cusps of the hydrogen. And these are, it's, it, it maps perfectly on the molecular structure. You don't see anything here because these hydrogens are on the top and above and below the plane. So uh, they don't contribute, they, they have no signature on this plane. So only the one that is on the plane that you, you see, you know, the one on the top. These two on the bottom do not show up here. Before leaving this, I will give you one more example that is more realistic. And here is a DNA <coughs> structure of uh, uh, Watson Creek 
base pair of guanine and cytosine, two of the four bases in DNA. This is in the plane of the, the base, of the Watson Creek base. And we will see here, uh, these are the, 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 the cusps. So this is the, this, I like this picture for some reason, but uh, uh, you can see here the chemical structure just jumps to your eye. I will fade the background in a moment so that you can see that this is not, no one has drawn this, it's calculated. That's the point. So I will just fade this a little bit, slowly, so that you see how the structure emerges naturally. See that? Including the hydrogen bonds that link. This is actually the genetic message right there. This is the ink with which your genes are written. That's how the, uh, you know, this line here is where, this line here, this, this zero flux surface here, this one, is where the genetic message is being determined. So I keep on fading this. Move. Encore, encore. Well, easy. Uh, so you can see here the, 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 the bond critical point here, the green, two bond critical, point bond critical point between nitrogen and hydrogen, between hydrogen and oxygen, here it is. Uh, a curved one here that uh, it's a bond path of a hydrogen bond. There is a ring forming, a ring, a ring, a ring, critical point, and so on. So that is mapped exactly over the drawing in every textbook of biochemistry, which is amazing, in my opinion. So, there is a, a leg there, I don't, you know, so it's a, forgive me for being slow here. Um, come on. One more. There. So uh, I go back to the example of the water. Now that's where Rene Tom comes in. So back. Ali, Ali. <laughs> here it is. So you will see a catastrophe here, a cusp catastrophe happening uh, when the structure will change abruptly. It will, the structure will remain the same. The geometry will change, but the structure is the same. The topology is the same. The, the set of bond path and bond critical points are exactly the same until you reach the catastrophe point and you will see chup, it, it, it sudden change in structure in this reaction between water giving hydrogen gas and oxygen, triplet oxygen. So we'll start pushing these, hydro, these two hydrogens together. So here, again, this comes from the Sanchez uh, thesis. Uh, you can see here the bond critical point are still, there is nothing here between these two. It's only the bond critical point go all the way to the oxygen. And this is the plot of the density over the symmetry line here. So you can see that there is, uh, uh, you know, a, a smooth uh, change. Here, here we are approaching the catastrophic change in structure. So here, in fact, there is a tiny little yellow dot here. You have a bond pass forming between the hydrogen for the first time. You created a ring between the three atoms. And the, if you push further, now these bond paths are going to vanish, go to, uh, the, 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 and you essentially have created a hydrogen molecule and an atom of oxygen if you push more. So uh, here is a little more. It's clearer that you have the ring critical point here and the new bond critical point. You know, you have two more. You can see here it's reflected. They changed the, the, the Poincaré-Hopf relation. So here is another example, the isomerization of a toxic molecule, HCN, hydrogen cyanide. And by the way, talking about hydrogen cyanide, at the beginning I presented a picture of uh, Gilbert Newton Lewis, who um, died in, I think, just after the Second World War, 46, something like this. He was found dead in his lab. He had a very intense argument that day with Langmuir, 
who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, I forgot what year, but they, pardon me? Uh, after? Uh, he died, yeah, he had, a, he, they were fighting all the time, you know, they were, he had a very uh, rough discussion with Langmuir that day, and he went to the lab, and an hour later, they found him died in the lab from HCN uh, inhalation. And there is a big fuss in the, in the history of chemistry, whether that was a suicide because he was obsessed, uh, upset from the discussion with Langmuir, or whether it was accidental, he was working on something and he just uh, died, you know. To this day, it's a mystery of science, so just like the, the mystery of uh, Eteor Majorana. Right? We don't know where is he. Uh, people from Italy would <laughs> know that. So, Eteore or Eteor? Ettore. Ettore. <laughs> Gra grazie, mille grazie. <laughs> so, uh, here we have, uh, is Majorana or Majorana? Majorana. Majorana. Yeah. Thank you. So, here I have uh, the HCN molecule. And then we will change the angle. We will make this hydrogen turn around and go here by just moving it, just uh, freezing the angle, but let the distance move at it, as it at will. All right. So we have two variables here: the, the distances, the distance. Let's say one of these distances. Let's say this one, and the angle. So you will reach a point, a transition point. The chemists uh, use this double dagger to indicate a transition point transition structure, and then after that you will uh, you continue the, the, the path until you reach this, uh, and these are, by the way, the distances in angstrom, and angstrom is 10 to the minus 8 uh, centimeter. So, so um, and this is the angle in, in, in degrees. So this I got from um, the internet, from the, this laboratoire in Grenoble, and uh, what you are seeing here is what we call a potential energy hypersurface, a, a term that was invented. It, it's based on something called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, because you need to separate the motion of the nuclei from the electrons. Uh, and then once you do that, then you can move the nuclei, freeze them, and then calculate the energy of the electronic system freezing the nuclei. The justification for this is that the masses are so different, and hence, the kinetic energy operator that has mass downstairs in the bottom below uh, denominator uh, becomes much, much smaller. So the motion of the mo nuclei compared to the motion of the electrons is negligible. The kinetic energy is negligible. So that's the basis. This, this has been introduced by Eyring and, pa and uh, Polanyi, Michael Polanyi and uh, Eyring back in the 30s, like 33 or something and is heavily used in chemistry. The concept of potential energy hypersurface, they are very difficult to represent because they are multi-dimensional surfaces. Essentially, in this one is easy because this one you have only two, uh, di two uh, uh, structural parameters, like a distance r and an angle, gamma, and then you, what you see in the third dimension is the energy. So what you have here is a valley and th so this is the bottom, the, the blue here is the lowest, and then you climb the energy wall on the two sides, and then you have a saddle point here. This is not density, this is energy. This is a saddle point in the energy hypersurface, and the saddle point here is a transition structure that I showed at the beginning, you know, this thing with the double dagger. So, um, and what you see here is a projection on a plane of that path. So the path is curved, like this path here, but this is the projection on a plane. All right, so this is how it looks like. And uh, these, what you see here, these, these wiggly things are, these are the molecular, uh, the, these are the vibrational wave functions. And you can see here the tunneling that can leak out a little bit. So here it is. So we will see what happened in terms of catastrophic change in structure and where it happens. Again, from Sanchez's thesis. Uh, so this is 180 degrees, here is the, abstraction of the molecular graph. Uh, and if you have, uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes because it started a bit later. Yeah. Okay, 10 minutes? Okay, <laughs> 15? <laughs> no, I come from Canada, so 
<laughs> Maybe you can give me five more. No, that's fine. Then it's fine. <laughs> so uh, here, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I just pressed this. Oops, back. Oh, 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 back, back, back. Come on. Well, I can have a coffee in the meantime. My apology, I just pressed uh, too much. So here it is, this is the starting point. And then this is 120 degrees. You can see the curved bond path here between the hydrogen and the carbon. Here it is. And this is, these are the uh, zero flux surfaces. Those the, your hydrogen is here. That's the bond critical point. This is the basin of the hydrogen, uh, attracting all the gradient vector lines that are uh, associated with the density. This is the carbon. Look at the carbon. It, nothing to do with sphere. People think of atoms like spheres. In molecules, they are not spheres. They are distorted geometries like this. Uh, this is the nitrogen on the other side here, the basin. And uh, now we are very close to the catastrophe. You know, the, again, this is a cusp catastrophe. And you can see here, the line takes a very weird shape. The, when, when you have zigzagging uh, lines like this, you are close to a catastrophic point. It's, it's an observation. So, it, it, you know, there's no fundamental reason I know of, but uh, it's an observation at least. So, the next slide, you will find that this line, instead of going to the carbon, phew, go to the nitrogen in infinitesimal change of structure. Uh, so uh, infinitesimal change in geometry will cause catastrophic change in structure. Let me be precise. I'm talking to mathematicians. Uh, the, the, yes, from the, it's the, exactly. So you are at the bottom here, but you're going up and up on the two sides, right? So this is 75 degrees, 70, oops. 72 degrees, so it happens in between the 75 and 72 degrees. Somewhere there, it happened. So now it, it goes to the other one. And if we follow this, here, 40 degrees, and zero degrees, you have changed the structure, the chemical structure, the bonded chemical structure. So, Before I close this, this talk, let me mention something. The theory, Bader's theory, and as I think uh, most significant advances in science have been criticized heavily. I'm not a lawyer for Bader or anything. I'm just was his student, but, <laughs> but, but I'm a bit partial, sure. But, but the work is significant. And because it is significant, it has been heavily criticized and attacked right, left, and center. For example, one of the lines of attacks are this. These are, this, this is a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, something you find in soot, in, in, in black uh, soot from, you know, burning, incomplete burning of organic matter. So it's a carcinogenic uh, compound, for example, this one. Uh, chemists draw it like this in traditional, textbook chemistry that will tell you this, these two hydrogen here are repelling each other by uh, what they call steric repulsion, which is not well defined at all. What is steric defined? Uh, show me this in the Hamiltonian. What is that? I don't know. So when you analyze the energy of these atoms, you find them actually more stable than the average energies of the other atoms here, hydrogen. In fact, there is every indication that these guys are stabilized locally. And that the di difference in energy has to do with the repartition of the energy. The energy of the different atoms are redistributed such that, for example, if you twist, if you have another, another system called biphenyl, if you twist it, the energy redistributes itself so that you observe uh, the barrier to the reaction of rotation of the two planes of the biphenyl, for example. So anyway, so these guys, are showing a bond path in the density, in the scalar field of the electron density. Meanwhile, this, there is a double ganger, there is like a shadow graph 
in another scalar field, which is the scalar field, the virial field, which is the potential energy density field, which when you integrate it, you get the potential energy of the system. So, uh, and if you look at the virial graph, you find the shadow graph identically, isom um, hom homeomorphic is called, homeomorphic, the, these are homeomorphic graphs, I think is the word, right? Homeomorphic. So, uh, ex they are, so what does it mean? It means that there are lines in space, they are, by the way, the, they are homeomorphic, but they are not superposed in general. They could be by symmetry, but not in general. So, whenever you have a bond path, you find another virial path, in other words, a line in space where the energy density compared to any neighboring line is a minimum. So, it's a line of stability which is the idea of associating chemical bonding with energetic stability, lowering the energy. So, there is, it's a very, very powerful concept. And the critics say, oh, you know, whenever you have two things in space, you squish them, you will form this bond path. That is simply not true. And there are counter examples where you push things in space, it doesn't happen. It has to have the right uh, physics and hence the right chemistry, because chemistry is physics. I can say this to this audience, but if I say it in a chemistry conference, they will throw tomato at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, it's very, uh, I think a colleague in this audience uh, yesterday has uh, mentioned that it's a pity that um, uh, two great men have not uh, crossed paths uh, and I take this idea and I say, these two men, I don't think they crossed paths. I, I forgot to ever ask Bader when I was doing my PhD with him, whether he met René Tom, because he was really, really an admirer of René Tom. Uh, you know, admired him tremendously, but I don't think they ever met, unfortunately. So, I close with the following quotation and I will lead maybe uh, ask the audience to perhaps read uh, this, maybe. Which is totally relevant because what we are describing is a change in structure. Uh, and in order to change structure, it doesn't happen in a frozen instant in time, it happens over time. So the way we describe the change in structure, in fact, is through dynamics. And, uh, and so this is totally relevant by René Tom. And to the critics, I would like to also share with you these two quotations because sometimes the cr criticism say, oh, it is so obvious, of course you will find the line, you know, what is, oh yeah, right, okay, <laughs> okay. So, I just leave you with these and Khalil Gibran is a Lebanese, is Gobran, Khalil Gobran in Arabic. Gobran, Khalil Gobran, he's a Lebanese poet. He wrote fantastic poetry in, in Arabic, but also uh, well known in, in, uh, in English literature. Oops, what happened here? Okay. So, merci beaucoup pour votre attention. that in fact you can replace this um, trajectory, gradient trajectory is joining to uh, two critical points by uh, so-called um, Talvik or uh, gradient extremals. Sure. Yeah. This gradient extremal corresponds to the point when there is a local uh, <coughs> extremum of the norm of the gradient along, along, uh, along mm -hmm. the, the fiber. And they correspond to the points where um, gradient is an uh, mm, eigenvector of, uh, of a Hessian. Right. Yes. And they have somehow mysterious structure because they, they sometimes they don't really go from one critical point to, to another. They go back some. And ah. this was this appeared in a, in a Studied by Hoffman, by people in the theoretical chemistry. Roald Hoffman? Yes, yes. in theoretical mm -hmm. chemistry.
So I will mention this a, a bit during my talk. Thank you very much. No, no, I appreciate it. Yeah. The reason I guess, I guess it's a guess here. Uh, that uh, the bond path was chosen is because it, it's more like uh, closer to the language of the chemists that they understand, you know. But uh, Bader was very careful not to say that this is a bond, because a bond is an undefined and you cannot see it, you know. You can see a bond path in experimental density. The, the crystallographers jumped on this theory. Open any crystallography book, uh, book or recent uh, article in the crystallography and chances that you will find all sorts of... Uh, a bond pass right, left, and center, you know. Mm -hmm. Just a <coughs> historical remark. Uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, one of the founders of semiotics, was uh, uh, Charles me? Sanders Peirce, a philosopher. Uh, uh, Charles Sanders yes. Peirce. Oh, Sanders Peirce. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was also a chemist. And uh, he, um, in the end of the 19th century, there were also logicians um, uh, discussing on chemistry how, how to organize this, this kind of structures and he uh, at the end of the 19th century he based his logics called relational logics okay. uh, on, on this uh, evolution of in, in logics uh, looking at chemistry and then he developed his uh, <coughs> theory of the sign uh, on this basis, so there is a historical connection. And he has also the uh, concept of valence transported into... Is that right? So I was not aware of this, yeah. but thank you. So yeah, maybe I should write it after after that. I will take for from you the exact uh, name and reference. If, yeah. I think that was all. So the pictures which I have seen, mm -hmm. that it seems that the number of critical points in the stable category uh, configurations is as minimal as possible. So you do not have maxima without explanation. So they sit in the middle of a cell. Like cells, yeah. 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 I, I, yes, I, I, because, um, you know, it's, 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 it's determined by the, all the, the electron density is an interplay between the, uh, the field that is called in DFT terminology the external potential, the, the, the field associated with the external potential, which is the potential that comes from the nuclei. But then you have to take the electron-electron repulsion, including the classical and the quantum uh, contributions. They all conspire to give pretty simple topologies. But then you can reveal a lot of, uh, a lot of structure by, by taking the Laplacian of the density. You know, you, we look a lot on Laplacian maps because it shows you the local region of local charge concentration, electronic charge concentration and depletion. And you can even see acids and bases whereby the acids are the, where the Laplacian is con shows concentration, lumps, physical lumps, like uh, lumps of, uh, you know, the Laplacian is, 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 has a, uh, a negative value and where there is a charge depletion is the opposite. And you can see that reactions very often happen when you when these two meet. So the Laplacian shows a lot of structure below. It's possible to yeah. ask Maxim. It's possible to ask the second question. Mm -hmm. yeah, but very short. Okay. Very short. Yeah. So your elbow pictures are they observed or computed? This is computed, but but all the bond path. You know, I can give. I, I should have put some experimental bond path. I didn't. I didn't put. But there are, I would say, hundred thousands. Ten thousands of bond paths are experimentally determined from X-ray diffraction using multipolar uh, uh, refinement. Because if you use the regular refinement, you cannot see these details. You need low temperature, uh, very good quality crystals, and uh, high energy sources like in the synchrotron soleil here near, nearby. I, I actually spent a couple of days in the synchrotron soleil a few years ago to do some experiment uh, that showed experimental bond path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you follow this idea of identifying the, the, the bound with uh, stable manifolds of uh, some critical points, not the bonds, the bond path. The bond path. Yeah. Uh, then they have a metric structure. They have some curvature, some shape. Yeah. So do you do, do you interpret this? Absolutely. Uh, this is a great question, but of course the time is limited. Uh, the length of the bond path for. Uh, the, the difference between the, the, the integrated length of the curved bond pass versus the interatomic distance, the internuclear distance, indicates stress and strain, yeah. strain in the bonding, and they correlate with energies of bond energies and so forth. 
perfectly. But, but and also, you can have integrated properties on the surfaces between these two and integrated properties between the two. For example, the delocalization of electrons. How do you quantify this? Well, you take the Fermi correlation, which is a six-dimensional thing, because it depends on the position of two electrons. So how the Fermi correlation, for example, is the... If I have an electron of a given spin here, in, in this atom, let's say, it excludes by Pauli principle all other alpha electrons from its vicinity. It creates something called the Fermi hole. And when it moves around, it if it's localized, let's, it's never localized completely because that violates quantum mechanics, but if it's relatively localized, it excludes every other electron of the same spin from its vicinity. And that immediately will encourage the beta electron to be here, so it pairs up. So you get the Lewis pair from the concept of electron localization and delocalization in this theory. And you can quantify it since now you can integrate, you can have the reference electron wipe one basin and the, the, the other electron in another basin to calculate the amount of electrons that are shared between the basins. So it's, um, I don't know if I res responded to your question correctly. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah. or but, yeah. but if you replace the electron density by the energy density, will it be the same result? Or? People have done that, you know, people have done that, but the electron density is the fundamental. Uh, this is what Hohenberg's Cohn theorem uh, predicted. So this is the starting foundation of this theory, but you partition the space on the basis of the electron density and its gradient vector field, but then we can integrate uh, also, we can average all sorts of properties by using the proper Hermitian operators averaged over the many electron wave function, properly normalized, anti-symmetric, and you average it within the basin to get the, that basin's contribution to the molecular, corresponding molecular property. Yeah, you, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you.